Good morning. That is really loud. You know, I get louder when I get excited when I preach, so you may want to turn that down. <laughs> How are y'all? My name is Dennis, and I get to be one of the pastors here, and I'm excited that you guys are here. Thank you for joining us. For those joining us for the first time, I, I pray that today would be a place, uh, today will be a time for you get to experience God's love and mighty word that he has for you today. I, I pray that, that you would open your hearts and I pray that for all of us, that today would be uh, a time where we can just say, God, thank you for loving me, for, for who I am. And because of that, I can go through life with whatever I'm facing. So a healthy inward focus leads to a healthy outward focus. And a healthy outward focus leads to a healthy inward focus focus. You know, there was a youth pastor who was excited because he was able to encourage the youth group to actually go to their schools, the high schools, the middle schools, and, and be able to uh, share Jesus with, with their classmates, those who don't know Jesus yet. And the youth pastor was very excited about that because there was an excitement in the youth group to invite their friends, uh, not only to church, but actually have a conversation about Jesus with them. And you and I know that that's a difficult thing. Difficult thing for adults and even more difficult for teenagers, right? To, to be able to share your faith in that way. So they've been praying, they've been working hard, strategizing, trying to figure out how they can love their friends best. And shortly after that, the Holy Spirit guided them and the Holy Spirit acknowledged what they were praying for and, and, and was generous to them by having those relationships with, with people that that as you are growing up, usually you don't have much in common with, especially if you grew up in a church setting. So they did. So they found a group of friends that they were just ministering to, loving on them, spending time with them during lunch, during, you know, every time they have a break. And, and one day, this group of teenagers decided, you know what, they've been inviting us to church for, for quite a while, so we're going to mark a date and we're going to go together. So there was a group of them. So the group of them decided, you know what, we're going to go together to church for the first time. But little do they know what church is like. Very little do they know. They only know about church and what they see in the movies. So they decided they're going to go to church dressed in suits and dresses like they're going to a wedding or a funeral. Those are the times you usually go to church. Right? And so they did. So they came to church as a group. They were all excited and they were, they were geared up. And, and their youth group friends were, you know, the kids at the church were very excited to see them. And, and they were coming in, and then you saw the congregation began to whisper. And one, one of the new kids heard, who are they? What are they doing here? Why are they dressed like gangsters? <laughs> so eager for the service to end, they were respectful enough to stay to the end and quietly Get out of there. Not one adult greeted them. None of the other pastors beside the youth pastor greeted them. Not because they were not seen, because they came in loud. Are y'all with me? You know, I wish I can tell you this is just an illustration. But this is the youth pastor. And I wish I could tell you that I'm not the only youth pastor that experienced that. But it happens in many churches, in many Sundays. Today we get to talk about an outward focus. Not because an inward focus is not important. But today, that was a topic they gave me to talk about. So we're going to talk about an outward focus. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, it's awkward. It's awkward to share our faith. It's awkward to relate with those without. It's awkward to have different perspectives with, with those that don't know you yet. And yet somehow 
you said that you have taken, you have not taken us out of this world. And somehow you called us to a way where people will get to know you. And the plan has not changed. People will come to know you and you will use your church. So teach us what that means. Allow the things that we're talking about today not just be one person's perspective. But allow it to be your perspective. Allow your word to speak boldly and allow us to have open hearts that we would hear and then we would apply. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the very young church in the book of Acts had a healthy inward focus because they had a healthy outward focus. And all this tied together, and I'm going to say this multiple times, the only way that's possible to have a healthy inward focus and a healthy outward focus is because they have a healthy upward focus. After the resurrection and the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, and they had a healthy inward focus of community. Jesus ascended to heaven, and they were together. They were together in solidarity, together present for one another. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit fills the place, as we read, right? And then Peter addressed the crowd, a crowd that was not yet part of their Christ-following community, having an outward focus. They were there for Pentecost, for the celebrations of that. Peter preached the gospel, and about 3,000 were baptized and added to the church that day. Their healthy, outward evangelistic focus brought 3,000. This, by the way, of a massive, multi-ethnic spreading of the gospel. Acts 2, verse 9, gives us some more hints of who were there. Here we are, the crowd, saying, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs were also there. And we all hear these people speaking in their own language about the wonderful things God has done. Just to give you an idea of how broad of a scope this was, the distance between Jerusalem and Rome, if you're walking is over 2,000 miles. Last time I checked, they didn't have Uber back then. <laughs> and maybe they, they had their chariots for those who can afford it, but it's about 2,000 miles. But the visitors were not just from Rome, they were also from modern Saudi Arabia, modern Libya, modern Turkey. That's quite a spread of people, the ones that are, there were 3,000 of them. They all just happened to be in Jerusalem, just happened to be in the same spot, just happened to be within earshot of Peter, sharing about Jesus, all that, and all at the same moment. How amazing is our God and how powerful is the Holy Spirit to make that happen? Do you see the wow moment in that? Folks, I want us to look around. How many of you were born in Orlando? Raise your hand. Look around. How many are there? I can count. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. I know. Those people living in Orlando, you're going to raise your hand again. How many of you were born in Florida? Raise your hand. One. Look around, people. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. How many of you were born in, in states that say y'all? <laughs> Southern states, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 2, 3, 21, 4, 21, 5, 6, 7, 7, about 30 y'all. Thank you. Get it? 30 of y'all. We're going to change this a little bit. How many of you were born outside the United States? Look around. I have a question for you. How powerful would it be? If God says the spirit would move at this, day, at this time from people from all over the world and hear God's word. 
And they will come together, they will stand together, they will sing together, they will pray together. They will be concerned for one another. They will love each other, will spur each other in God's word because they are my church. <laughs> Folks, every Sunday, every time we gather, every time we meet, it's a wow moment because the Holy Spirit is there. Because there's no way any of us can figure this out, how it just happened. Do you guys hear that? It's an impossibility in human standards, but it's not a impossibility for the God who does all these things. After the festivities of the Pentecost, the early believers had a healthy outward focus. These internationals went home and they shared what they heard about Jesus and they created their own communities. Even though the book of Acts doesn't speak much and not until later until Paul does his travels that we figure out that, that those communities actually grew, right? But to those believers that were in Jerusalem continue to be together, Acts 2, 44 to 47. We've been talking about this in Acts 2, Acts, Acts 4. And all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. These Jerusalem believers thrive in having a very healthy inward focus. And why not? Why would, not, why would anyone not be, one apart, be a part of that? These believers gathered up to worship together, share meals together, and share everything they had, even to the point of selling their property and possessions and sharing their money with those in need. Maybe, maybe, and I thought about this as because I'm silly like that. Maybe the Lord was just adding to their numbers those who were poor and needy. Hmm. These early church followers had a healthy outward focus as they are healthy with their inward focus because they had a healthy upward focus. Acts 14, 13, verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. Did you catch that? Were they extraordinary? No. Was there something super special about them? No. Did they have special training? No. Which to me sounds offensive. <laughs> I, mean, I was with Jesus, right? All the three years of ministry. <laughs> I was there through everything. But that's how he was described. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of this council chamber and conferred among themselves. So even as the early church were gathering, the apostles, the leaders of the church were still out doing outward ministry. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they performed miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. Folks, I like that part. It says that you cannot deny that God has performed a miraculous, miraculous sign and everyone knows about it. Let's parallel that to today. When people meet us as individuals or as a church, can people see the miraculous sign that God is doing in our lives? When people meet you, when people talk to you, can they see the miracles of God working in you? Can they see the miracles of God working in me? Do they know about it? Verse 17, but to keep them from spreading the propaganda any further, we must warn them not to... Speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. So they called the apostles back in the command and commanded them never again to speak or teach the name of Jesus. Verse 19. But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for the miraculous signs and the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. I like how it says we cannot stop telling them about everything we have seen and heard. Acts 420. 
Why were they so excited? Not worrying how the people would react. Did not worry about the captain of the temple guard. They did not worry about the council of rulers and elders who were out to get them. They were not intimidated and they were not scared. And many of the people, Acts 4.4, 4, many of the people who heard their message believe it. So the number of men who believe now totaled about 5,000. From 3,000, it became 5,000. And these are just the men counted, making the number even more if you count their wives and their children and their households. And even when they grew in numbers, you would think that's a big number already, right? That's a lot of people. They stuck to the same formula. The growth in numbers did not ease them from being united in heart and mind, and it did not stop them from sharing everything they had. They felt that what they owned was not their own. This was, without a doubt, the work of God's Spirit. They had a healthy outward focus and a healthy inward focus because they had a healthy upward focus. The question is, does God's Spirit still work with the same kind of power today as it did back then? We say quickly, yes, right? Or now we hesitate because, oh boy. (laughs) Because there are things that God is asking. I wish I could tell you that every time the religious leaders got hold of the apostles, the apostles got away, but that was not the case. At the end of Acts chapter 5, though the apostles were not killed at that time, they were beaten and they were flogged. And this is how they responded, Acts 5, 41. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of of Jesus. Fellow believers, today, when we see a believer suffer for the work of Christ, we go to war. Rather than the reply they had then, when they said it was worthy to suffer the disgrace. And verse 42, and every day, In the temple, from the house to house, they continued to teach and preach the message. Jesus is the Messiah. A healthy inward focus always leads to a healthy outward focus. A healthy outward focus always leads to a healthy inward focus. And neither of these can exist without a healthy upward focus. It's not a choice of whether we want an inward-focused church or an outward-focused church. It's not one versus the other. Rather, each, each needs the other because they cannot survive without each other. An inward focus versus outward focus should not even be a thing. It should not be even in conversation. That undermines the work of Christ both inside and outside the walls of the church. Stated differently, both choices, if left without the other fall short of the mark of what's being healthy, of what it means to be healthy. Again, just to be clear, an inward focus and an outward focus need to point towards an upward focus. If the upward focus is what makes it work, then those things will be healthy. It is always about our upward focus, our look into God, seeking Him, asking for His direction, loving the way He calls us to love, And loving who he calls us to love. He is the reason. He is the way. He is the conviction. He is the strength. And to him be all the glory. Because it's not about the debate of what we should do. God brought us near to himself while thrusting us towards the nations. Let me say that one more time. God brought us near to himself while he thrusts us, while he pushes us, while he encourages us, while he calls us towards the nations. We are meant to live in rhythm with those two forces. And it's a beautiful rhythm. Going out by staying close to him. Staying close to him, yet you are sent out. Like one pedals a bicycle. One foot goes up, the other one pushes down. We need to have that beautiful, rhythmic, working together, healthy, inward and outward focuses. Because it's impossible to have one healthy without the other. So, 
This sermon today is actually just about the outward focus. So that was the intro. You're welcome. (laughs) It took me this long to get to that point because I heard many ask, so Dennis, what are we doing about our lack of inward focus? We need to work on teaching our people more about the Bible. Focus on the study of lifestyle disciplines. I'm supposed to be li- that the one, the one I'm supposed to be living in, and this and that. Amen. I don't agree. I mean, I don't disagree with you. Also, many ask, what are we doing about our outward focus? What are we doing in reaching out to our community, outside our walls, supporting our missionaries, going on on missions ourselves? Amen. <laughs> I agree with you. But if you don't do both and you don't do it well and you don't have a healthy rhythm about it, then something goes wrong real bad, right? John 10, 14 to 16. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me just as my father knows me. I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Amazing, Jesus. Thank you. For loving those that are part of your fold. But verse 16, he says this. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheephold. Then Jesus said, well, forget about them. No, he did not. He said, I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. Did you hear that? And since today's sermon is just on the outward focus, I don't want you to think that I don't care about the inward focus. All right, I'm going to make that clear because we will not have an upward focus if we ignore either one. We are to support the missionaries who serve outside our reach, and we are to be missionaries to those within our reach. Let me say that one more time. We are support the missionaries to those that are outside our reach. But guess who are the missionaries within our reach? We are. Have you considered that? We are to learn and care about their stories as we are eager to tell them about our story, including our own testimonies about Jesus. Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 19. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God, who shows no partiality and cannot be bright. How much partiality does he show? How much favoritism? He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So you, too, must show love to foreigners. For yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. I mean, if you study this more, folks, there are so many instructions on how they're supposed to do that. So when the command on, or the, the setting in Acts 2 and the setting in Acts 4, where, where, where the followers of Jesus were caring and, and being generous to one another, folks, it's not new. It was actually commanded back then to the people of Israel. But what did they do? They did not. God has allowed them to their own way of not being that kind of people who have a healthy inward and outward focus, focusing upward to God. There was a division, right? There was a division between Israel and what we call Gentiles. Are you all with me? Into the New Testament has that changed. No, but here, hear me out, folks. Help me out here. And this might get me in trouble, so it's okay. Dennis, be brave. Say it. (laughs) I can argue that we still do it right now. With Christians and those that don't know Jesus yet. We are to share share our lives within the community inside. And we are to share our lives with the community outside. Not to be influenced by them. I didn't say that. But to be able to love them as Jesus loves us. John 17, 15 to 18. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, Jesus prayed. But to keep them safe from the evil one. 
Verse 16, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to about us. Verse 17, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. A healthy inward focus leads to a healthy outward focus. If we have a healthy upward focus. Be able to see how God is working in people's lives, even when we don't see that they're following him yet. Romans 2, 14. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. <gasps> nah, I'm glad he wrote it because then it would not be controversial. It's in the Bible. <laughs> Verse 15. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. I want you guys to see this. The Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of those that don't know Jesus yet. The same way he was working in your hearts when you did not know Jesus yet. Amen. Who do you think brought you to Jesus? It's Jesus himself. Amen. Sometimes we forget that. When God made us in our mother's womb, intricately, he put in there already the desire, the need to know God and his ways. Amen. Even at that moment, who made you? God did. Right. Having compassion for those who don't know him yet is not an option. Helping them know God who does the transformation and to not simply wag our fingers at their sins that's not an option. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, we spoke about this several months ago. There were those that were so-called following Jesus or following God and those that they were not sure. And in the parable, Jesus asked, now which of these three would you say was our neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. Verse 37, the man replied, the one who showed the mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Was it selective? No. First Peter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very soul. Some of us like that, those inward people. Oh, championing inward. And we champion both. But be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Yes, you should. So that we will not be influenced by them. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong. I don't want you guys to see this. Because we were so quick to pass this in the passage. They will see your what? Honorable behavior. And they will give honor to God. When he judges the world. Who is the day the scripture is talking about here? Those neighbors that don't know him yet. That they will see our honorable behavior. So be careful when we deal with our neighbors that don't know him yet. Do not fall to the trap of being dishonorable. Disrespectful. Because God calls us to love them, not be at war with them. And I don't need to go political here, but we know, all of us know, that there's a war against us. But the way we respond to that is what? We love them. We forgive them. We bring hope. We become the light and the salt, as Jesus talks about. Dennis, that's unfair. Guys, fairness died in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned, and Jesus still clothed them. God still clothed them. That was not fair. And while we were still sinners, 
He gave himself on the cross. While we were still sinners. That was not fair. And even us, the church, still don't do, still don't understand, still don't get that we need to have a healthy inward focus and we need to have a out, healthy outward, uh, outward focus. And still, God still shows up, blesses us, heals us, encourages us, forgives us, brings us hope, brings us peace, teaches us what it means to be church. Folks, that is not fair. So why is it that we're allowing God to not be unfair, meaning so generous with us, and yet we're not allowing those who don't know him yet because it's not fair? It doesn't make sense, does it? Folks, grace is not fair. Mercy is not fair. So let's stop using the argument of fairness. Are my kids listening? <laughs> Be able to let them know that the most important thing about our faith is our love relationship with God and not our love for just being rule followers. Acts 15.10. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither, nor your, neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved by the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. We need to hold on to this truth that while becoming and or being Christian does not always result in instantaneous outward change and we cannot see the victory of sin right away, change is possible. And we trust God that he is working in people's lives. Amen? Amen. Folks, Let's be reminded by this. Those who don't know him yet, the moment they are seeking, the moment they are realizing that God loves them, the moment they're recognizing that God wants a relationship with them, that God wants to forgive them, in the process of repentance, those who speak Christianese here, and you and I all know that it's a process, right? In the process of repentance, the radical, the transformative, the permanent change is possible for our new, for those who are new to faith the Holy Spirit can transform a murderer into a missionary, an adulterer into a faithful person, a racist into a person who recognizes and loves just like God loves every kind of people. But we need to ask ourselves, we need to understand these things. We need to be sure that we get it, that repentance and the transformation is a process. So here's a question. Let's, let's put it to our level. And this might be painful a little bit, just a little bit. So we'll just rip it off like a band-aid. Is God working in your life still? Have you already attained that perfection? I told you it's going to hurt like a band-aid. <laughs> Is God still transforming you? Is God done with you yet? And then why do we assume that he's done with them? We need to ask these hard questions of ourselves. Do I find it hard to be friends with those who seem to be constantly doing wrong things? Do I think that it's not my responsibility to help people who will not help themselves? Do I privately feel grateful to be a Christian, especially when I see others' faults and failures? Am I passionate in sharing Jesus as I am passionate standing against those values that are against him? Do I think those who follow God's rules are more deserving of God's love than those who don't? Am I more worried about how the world can influence my family than I am about being God's salt? and light to the world. Do I really believe that Jesus is for everyone, regardless of who they are and what I have done or what they have done? Do I believe that the hope of Christ is really for all? Acts 11.9, Peter shares his prayer and vision. 
as a council in Jerusalem, were figuring out what to do with those believers that don't look like them. The new believers that are not acting like them. They're not circumcised. They're not eating the same food. They're not doing the same spiritual disciplines they were. Peter said, Acts 11.9, But the voice from heaven spoke again, Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Acts 11, 18, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The enemy is really good at deceiving us, at dividing us. And the enemy is really good in using us for making others feel that they're unworthy. That's the enemy's work. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Jesus said, John 6, 44. Luke 15, 1 through 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. A couple of years ago, I got the opportunity to preach on that and I focused on the word grumble. They grumble. It's an adjective. It's that making a low rumbling sound. I'm grumbling. It's expressing complaint in a bad tempered way. That was the Pharisees. The, those were the Sadducees. Those were the scribes that grumbled. Grumbling is not good, especially when directed towards those that Jesus calls us to love, especially to those that Jesus decided he's going to hang with. It's hard to love. I'm sorry. It's hard to grumble to the ones that Jesus calls you to love once we realize that you will not be able to reach those that you are grouchy towards did you guys hear that simplifying it here <laughs> you can't if you're grouchy towards me why would I want to spend time with you please don't do that and I'm grouchy with you why would you want to have ice cream with me because the ice cream's better I'm just kidding we are to expect the criticism to send the oppositions when reaching others. Let, let me be clear with that. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's not true. Because the enemy is good at making us fear and tempting us for the doubt. But yet, we push on. We do it anyway. An outward focus means we stop objecting to who God calling us to love. And we are to start praising Him. Because he has allowed us to love. Did you see that? Do you hear that? What can we do to help others? How can we show them the love of Jesus to others? Who can we minister to? Folks, some of you leaders have asked, Dennis, how do you want, what would be the dream? What's your prayer request for Vista as a community? I go, you know, our name says it. Vista Community Church. We have a choice of what that community means. Is it just inward or is it also outward? If you go out of our parking lot and turn left, just past the next light is the middle school. Right? To your right. If you leave our parking lot, make a right and then make a quick left, there's an elementary school right there. That's the largest place where families within a three-mile radius of us go. How many of us are there? If you make a right out of our parking lot, go down Chickasaw, make a left on Lee Vista. Well, Bache was right there on the right. That's where I want to hype ice cream. But keep going. You eventually get to the light of Econ Lakachi Trail. Right? Livia Slay and Econ Lakachi. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? 
You know, if you make a right there, there's, there's a roadblock. Because there's a community that's forming. Last time I heard, it's about between three to 5,000 homes are coming. Because it's going to go all the way to the 528. I'm asking you, are that, is that the community God's calling us to? Here's another question. You and I know that our property taxes are going up because the house value is going up because people are moving into Orlando. You can call that a curse. And I'm not saying that that's not a taxing thing. Get it? <laughs> but I can tell you this. It's a Holy Spirit movement. The world's coming to us. Maybe it's because we're not going to them. But regardless, the world is coming to us. How will the Holy Spirit move? Would you pray with me for these communities? Would you pray for me that we have a healthy outward focus as we are having a healthy inward focus so we can really know what it means to have a healthy upward focus? Let's pray. Father, it's easy for us to say that it's somebody else's job. It's easy for us to say or feel that it's not our responsibility. It's, it's not our care. It's not our job. It's not our responsibility. And yet we say this is church. And yet we say that you're still moving. And yet as you are teaching us with the truth of your word, allowing our hearts to more and more surrender to you, allow us to understand that that catapults us, that that pushes us, that we are commanded to go, that we are to have an outward focus. So I pray for the future families that we be living in that intersection of Lee Bista and Econ Lakachi all the way to the 528. I pray for the students and their families who go to Liberty Middle School. Lord, I pray for the students and the families of those that go to Hidden Oaks Elementary. I pray for every school around us where our kids go and the schools our kids don't go. I pray, Lord God, for the community that goes to Publix for their groceries, that goes to Walmart for their groceries, the ones we sit behind a stop sign with or a red light from. I pray for those that are thinking of moving to Orlando. I pray for those that already moved to Orlando. I pray, Lord God, that you give us a heart for those that don't know you yet. And Lord, help me not fight that with my own pride. Teach us, show us, direct us, and be before us. Holy Spirit, we are grateful because you will use our church so that people will come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.